As a registered dietitian, what I've been doing for over 20 years is not typical. So it was very atypical me coming as a clinical dietitian, working in disease, working in nutrition support, and moving into the pharmaceutical world. It's been back since the 1970s where we've had regulations when it came to these individual nutrients and actually defining mm. the area of dietary supplements because it became so murky. And there's a lot of foods that are making claims. There's nutrients and benefit in there that FDA has stepped in to say, you cannot make this type of claim. And the same on the dietary supplement side, yeah. you know, there's certain claims that you cannot make because it's stepping into the food arena. So what they have paved the way is there's a different regulatory path to proceed to market a food as there is a dietary supplement, as there is an OTC, and then drug. Welcome to the Coach MD Podcast. I'm Dr. Charles Glassman, bringing you three decades of experience as a physician and a coach. Join us as we navigate the maze of medical advice with real life stories, empowering you to take charge of your health. In our That Happens segment, guests share transformative experiences, reminding us that we're all human and not just patients. So get ready for a journey into healthcare reimagined, where empowerment and discovery pave the way. Hey, it's Dr. Charles, aka Coach MD. In my over 30 years of medical practice, I've made it my goal to help people create a strong mind, a healthy body, and an unshakable spirit. And in, in, in that regard, I started the Coach MD podcast because I wanted people to be introduced to guests who can tell a little bit about themselves and their own health journey and also uh, obtaining knowledge because so many people these days really have to become experts on themselves, have to do their own research, have to know uh, kind of beyond what their regular doctor is telling them because with all due respect to my colleagues, you know, it's hard to keep up and most doctors will take the, the uh, reflex and when someone comes to them, especially with supplements, which we're gonna talk a lot about today, Doctors will say, ah, no, nah, there's no research on that. Ah, it doesn't work. Oh, there's no studies. And basically the translation of that, if you want me, I'm a, I'm a great doctor translator. I, I guess I'm bilingual in that respect. You know, So I, I know doctors speak doctor language, and that means I don't know. I don't really know. So, so when a doctor tells you that, if you bring something, just understand that it's because they don't know. And, and so my guest today, Lisa Dispenza has had a lot of experience in the field of supplements from the pharmaceutical end of it. Now, a lot of people, when they think of supplements or natural substances or natural supplements, the first instinct is not to think of the pharmaceutical companies because, oh, the pharmaceutical companies, oh, they're drugs. And, and you know, what, what I really want people to understand because they've they know me as an open-minded doctor. And what open-minded means is open-minded. It doesn't mean you're closed-minded to uh, Western medicine on one side and open-minded fully to other homeopathic, if you will, medicine on the other side. So allopathic or homeopathic. No, there's everyone is different. Every body is different. And it always takes a combination of knowledge and interventions from all different areas. And so the pharmaceutical industry has to be commended for great discoveries and, and has made our lives a lot better in, in so many areas. Um, so, you know, a lot of people, they, when they heard I was open-minded doctor, they came to me, Oh, you're holistic. Oh, so am I. And they totally, say that, oh, allopathic medicine is completely evil, right? And and the pharma, big pharma is evil. We can't do anything that, that touches upon that. And so, no, that's not the case. You have to find a common ground that works for you. So Lisa, thank you so much, uh, uh, Voice of Reason, for coming on my, my show today. And, you know, I want you to tell my listeners a little bit about your background and how you got uh, involved in the pharmaceutical industry and what side of the pharmaceutical industry you've got to experience and work with. 
Sure. Thanks for having me, Charlie. It's so important to get this information out there. As a registered dietitian, what I've been doing for over 20 years is not typical. So it was very atypical me coming as a clinical dietitian, working in disease, working in nutrition support, and moving into the pharmaceutical world. I was probably the only the only registered dietitian working in there, largely pharmacists, physicians. But it's the dietitian who's really well trained in nutrition sciences mm -hmm. and can really help interpret this research. And I was very fortunate to start working with Pfizer Consumer Healthcare. It was Wyeth at the time who was very willing to advance the science. There is limited data in dietary supplements or at mm -hmm. least final products. We have a lot of uh, science in the area of individual ingredients, nutrition, uh, but not necessarily when you start combining ingredients. So I was able to work in the area of research for all these years and then help to formulate dietary supplements and global brands, brands like Centrum and Caltrade in over 90 countries. Uh, we have, uh, Centrum has participated as well as Caltrade in many long-term clinical trials. So we can really see that there is evidence of benefit. Anytime you take a supplement, there's a benefit risk ratio you need to be able to assess. From my side, internally working with experts, uh, that's exactly what we do. Does this have a known benefit? Do we have enough science to support it? And is there the risk low? Because there's always going to be ingredients, contaminants, things that are naturally found in ingredients. You know, in calcium, there can be lead. In the lettuce we consume, there can be lead, right? Pesticides, other toxins. So it's always looking at dietary supplements, really, it, to sum up what I've been doing is uh, looking at the science, advancing it, running clinical trials, and then also trying to ensure that there's the preponderance of the evidence is supporting the role for this product or this combination of nutrients. Mm, that's that's great. Now, you know, a question that I have, and, and I know many people have, um, the FDA is the, uh, the body, the legislative body or regulatory body that oversees the food and drugs that we take in. Um, and it's interesting that Food and Drug Administration is in the same regulatory body because we don't, when we think of foods, we don't necessarily think of drugs, right? But, you know, foods are really uh, the ultimate drug, if you will. Uh, you know, drugs are are supposed to be available to make our, our lives better, to make us healthier, and we want to consume our foods the same way. Um, but what's your, you know, if you could kind of, educate me and and uh if you know this uh <laughs> kind of throwing this out but um like how did the fda become merged like how did the food and drug how did it become one regulatory agency do you know i i don't know i mean if that's i don't know something... if i could answer that directly right. but yeah. it's been back since the 1970s where we've had regulations when it came to these individual nutrients and actually defining mm. the, the area of dietary supplements because it became so murky. And there's a lot of foods that are making claims that, mm. you know, things that shouldn't be, or that there's nutrients and benefit in there that um, FDA has stepped in to say, you cannot make this type of claim. And the same on the dietary supplement side, yeah. you know, there's certain claims that you cannot make because it's stepping into the food arena. So what they have paved the way is there's a different regulatory path to proceed to market a food as there is a dietary supplement, as there is an OTC and then drug. Right. Okay. So uh, you know, when someone picks up a cereal bottle, a cereal box, and it says, uh, eat this cereal and you won't get heart disease, right? You know, I mean, so obviously that's a no-no. And, uh, you know, look, sometimes we need regulations. I'm not a big government guy where I think big brother needs to be in every part of our life, but there are certain areas that people 
you know, will try to get away with, you know, and, and try to make claims and try to say things that really aren't true or, or really haven't been uh, proven or uh, played out. And, and so it could be dangerous. So, um, you know, supplements, I have always you know, had the feeling that, you know, the foods that we eat and the environment that we get those foods from and, and so, so many foods now are mass produced that they can't possibly have the nutritional value that they used to have when it used to be farm to table. Uh, and that's just the way it was. But now with, with uh, the in, environment and the, and the ground uh, where we get the, the food from and the, the mass producing it's, it's hard. So, to get those nutrients and you know how you know how much nutrients to take and and i know that ever since i've i've been younger i've been taking nutritional supplements and um and i've changed and i'll talk about that in a little bit we'll talk about that uh, how i've changed it but um when did uh let's say you you start with pfizer when did pfizer start seeing in their consumer end or i guess wyeth um when did they start seeing that obviously there was a market for it, but it, it, it's supply and demand. They saw that the, there was a demand. So they decided, you know, when did that start happening when they started looking at having to develop a supply for that demand? So that happened really at the end of 1970s. And I actually had the privilege of working with Dr. Leon Ellenbogen, who was the lead scientist chemist who formulated Centrum Silver. Mm. And he formulated it really ahead of his time because he had the high levels of vitamin B12. And we really didn't understand that. Uh, he worked largely in the area of intrinsic factor needed to absorb B12, mm. as did his predecessor who hired me. And uh, so they always had higher levels of certain ingredients for that 50 plus. We also didn't necessarily know that it was 50 as a cutoff per se, uh, where nutrient needs change. I think the science met up with some of the um, some of the the estimations that Dr. Ellenbogen made in formulating Centrum Silver, we have a lot more from the Institute of Medicine, National Academy of Sciences that has really, they have expert councils for every single nutrient, essential mm. nutrient publications on that. And we use that as guidance to formulate something like a multivitamin. Uh, but I would say it was around 1979, 1980 when Centrum Silver launched and just took off. And Centrum followed that. And since then, I think they have really truly been the leaders in industry. And then it became genderized and then many more age uh, differentiations, um, breaking up the nutrient needs. For example, teenagers, they the highest need for calcium is in the teenage years, mm. right? But then that starts to decline. Yes. And the needs for um, you know, vitamin D changes, needs during pregnancy. So really looking at those critical life stages and formulating according to that based on really National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine guidance that we have. And that's been updated. It's a slow progress mm -hmm. you know, process because it's government. Um, but I'd say the, the most current we have is around 2005, 2006 publications. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, you know, um, <clears throat> what, what, what people don't realize that when they talk about holistic medicine or, or natural, you know, when they say I'm into natural medicines or I only take vitamins, whatever, what they don't realize is that the same science that went into developing medications has been going on for decades when looking at nutritional supplements, because mm -hmm. the different uh, cycles that the body has then the different cofactors that are responsible for those cycles. And so those, those metabolic processes, scientists, you, many of them from the pharmaceutical industry had to discover what those cofactors were. And so, you know, Lisa's talking about vitamin B12, for instance, and uh, vitamin B12 
uh, and has to be absorbed into the body. And the only way it can be absorbed into the body is through something that's produced in the stomach, intrinsic factor that helps it get absorbed. Now, as one gets older, a lot of times we lose the cells in our stomach that pr produce this, uh, this, this cofactor and can't absorb B12 and B12 goes down and, and there's symptoms of fatigue or nervous symptoms or cognition and memory and all sorts of things. But also if one takes, for instance, doesn't have acid, which intrinsic factor needs the hydrochloric acid, the hydrogen uh, atom, it, when you don't have those hydrogen atoms, because taking uh, uh, taking uh, antacids, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, the, the proton pump inhibitors, which totally shut off the acid, or even the uh, medications like Pepsid, uh, those types of medications, they may cause a decrease in the absorption of B12. So it's important to know that, uh, and this is where it goes, you know, some doctors will say, oh, no, you don't need any supplements. Oh, you don't need anything. But then when you really understand that there is a lot of science that goes by, go, goes behind it, is behind it, and that the cofactors really are the... Um, the vitamins and and those and, and 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 certain enzymes and one i love to talk about and you know as the quote holistic doctor that my colleagues would look at and kind of you know they wouldn't laugh they respected me but i know that they didn't really uh buy into some of the things that i would do for my patients for instance when a patient would go into the hospital and i would sneak when they were on IV antibiotics and I would sneak in probiotics for them, you know, because they only had one on the, on the formulary there. But vitamin D is a big one. And we'll talk about that because vitamin, one. yeah, vitamin D up until like 2010 or even a little bit later, most doctors were not checking their, their patients for it. When I was putting my patients on vitamin D, they were, ah, no, you don't need it. Oh, we don't need it. Uh, you know, so in one breath, it's kind of like the, the women's health initiative in the, in the early 2000s, where yes. one day doctors were telling all the women who were menopausal to go on Premarin and Provera. And then the very next day they're saying, oh, you got to come off of it. It's going to cause you cancer, which th that's a whole other story. And, and I'm not going to get into it. It's a little complicated, but that's how doctors think it's black or white. Right. Okay. Vitamin D. Oh, oh, it doesn't work. Oh, those things don't work. And then the next day, oh, you got to go on vitamin D. You have vitamin D deficiency. So when in your career did that start coming, coming around where? Uh, oh, for years. I mean, yeah. the early 2000s, I've worked with the vitamin D experts from around the world who are, con you know, contrast to the dermatology experts, right? Because you cannot get adequate vitamin D from diet alone. Mm -hmm. The primary source is sunlight. The dermatologists want you to cover your skin <laughs> and the vitamin D experts want you to expose it. Um, but supplementation really comes into play. What you're taking is not what your body's using. It needs to get converted to the active form that takes time. Mm -hmm. So the, the, it needs to, the cholecalciferol, the vitamin D3 is most commonly on the market that gets converted to the 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And then it's not even agreed upon at what level is showing the benefit. So just because you don't show up on the lab as deficient, you really could be suboptimal. And suboptimal should be a key to the thread here with this conversation, because that's what's running through a lot of the issues with other vitamins and minerals as well and chronic disease. Mm -hmm. But it's it's looked at more upon as getting as high as about 75 nanograms per milliliter, not what the 20 nanograms per milliliter the labs are showing where you're, you're fine and the doctor yeah. may not say anything. And then how much do you supplement? Is the thousand I use that's in your multivitamin sufficient? Do you take 2000 or that may not even move the needle? Yeah. You may need a prescription level to get you to some type of baseline. And then from there, take something a little bit lower or, you know, a dietary supplement level. So there's a lot. And also with obesity, 
you may see that they appear deficient, but the vitamin D is trapped in those fat, that adipose tissue. Mm. As someone loses weight, then you start to see their vitamin D levels normalize. Yeah, that is great. What a great point that is because uh, so many vitamins, you know, you have your water soluble vitamins, you have your fat soluble vitamins, uh, D3, cholecalciferol, which is a fat soluble vitamin or hormone, pro hormone, if you will, has so many different functions. And as Lisa said, that the uh, uh, the measure is the 25 OH. That's the active. That's what you check in the blood. That's what your doctor should be checking. Um, is is that level? And uh, yeah, I, I mean, you may have a level of I, I think 20 to 30 is the low uh, the low level, uh, but, but in the normal range. And I know that myself. If I, I, I take 5,000 uh, international units of vitamin D3, I was taking it a, maybe three days a week and my level was like in the low 30s. Mm -hmm. I went a little higher. So I started taking it every day. And But it's important to, to measure it, to have somebody measure it. Just don't take it willy nilly and, and do it because uh, that's not the, you know, not how you should do things. You really should monitor and everybody is different. So- uh, it's probably better and it's safe. It's, it's safe. There, there were some studies uh, that were done that were uh, pretty much, I, I think, debunked, uh, but they were in, I think maybe 2015 or whatever that was saying that uh, the vitamin D was, had uh, increased cancer risk. If it was above 75, it increased cancer risk. But the, those studies paled in comparison. And when you really look at those studies, they weren't done well. Um, they pale into comparison with the thousands of studies which show that vitamin D3 is actually a supplement that is can help in so many different ways. And I, and I think especially in those areas where there isn't a lot of sun, like the Northeast, for instance, most people are deficient in vitamin D3. When I say deficient, that means their levels are lower than the low 30s. Um, you know, so it's, it's a safe supplement, no matter what your doctor might tell you. Um, and you could start off by taking them over the counter and they're cheap. They're really inexpensive. Well, that That's the thing. It's inexpensive. Yeah. And yeah. it's really going to help drive that calcium into the bone. And yeah. that's important with age. I mean, really starting as young as 30 years old, you know, you've already optimized your bone growth. You know, now it's either you're going to maintain or it's going to start to decline. Uh, so that's really important that you're getting that out, that calcium into the bone and yeah. vitamin D is needed to drive it in. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, and that's a, one of the, the biggest roles that vitamin D plays is, is that, um, is with bone health. Um, now, you know, one of the things that, uh, again, the pharmaceutical industry that we could feel confident about uh, is quality. And yeah. there are so many uh, thousands of, of supplements out there. And there are, there are some, um, uh, websites that you can go to and that you can uh, join. Uh, one is, oh God, if I remember the name, I'll put it in the link in in in, uh, in the description of this, but con consumer health, I, I, I belong to it. I can't even remember the name, but it actually does testing, independent testing on yes. supplements. Consumer labs. Consumer labs, that's it. It's consumer labs. And uh, as opposed to consumer reports, this mm -hmm. is consumer labs. And they actually do really good testing on, on different supplements because there are so many thousands out there. Um, but the pharmaceutical company does, does up the game when it comes to quality. And no matter what, how, what you feel about the pharmaceutical industry, they, their quality, they're going to produce quality products and they're going to make sure that they're not contaminated. So uh, what, what is your exposure to that and knowledge about that? you you've been in the industry, you've seen how it's done. How would you compare it to some of the other practices that you see possibly other form, uh, supplement companies in, uh, involved in? Well, it's fascinating. The pharmaceutical companies, the large consumer healthcare companies are slow to the market. Mm -hmm. 
right? They're not hitting the shelf and they don't have all this turnover and all the very um, uh, many SKUs of products because of their quality, mm -hmm. because it takes time to quantify and standardize and characterize and then agree on to releasing that product. So it's quite impressive. Now, products that I've worked on, yes, they've been picked up by consumer labs. And I think that's the way to look at it because there's no way to know quality mm -hmm. unless you're behind the scenes, unless you're working for the company. But if you just pick up a label, there's no way to, to review that. Even if it says USP, if companies like a Pfizer at the time, if they would do USP, they would have to drop their standard, mm. right? So it's there's no way of knowing unless it's independently tested. Now I can't say consumer labs got it right all the time, right? right? Yeah. The, the way that they would report it, but you want to ensure that those nutrients that are stated on the label are at that level at the end of expiry dating which means that the delivery form matters. A lot of people are taking gummies. Mm -hmm. Gummies, they've got to put in excessive levels in because it's undergoing this heat treatment and now it's dropping levels and it needs to be maintained over that two year you know, um, expiry dating. But to go back to the pharmaceutical world, mm -hmm. then the pharmaceutical world and the consumer healthcare companies, they can maintain that quality to put it in a long-term NIH clinical trial, you can't change the supplier. You can't change the manufacturing, the, the release dates. There's nothing that can be changed. It has to be so tightly maintained and controlled to be in a study mm. as well as to sit on the market. And the other piece of it is to run a clinical trial on your final marketed product. That's very different than having clinical trials on individual ingredients. How do these ingredients work together? Are they synergistic or not? Or do they compete with each other? The money that that takes, it's always starting at a million dollars to actually have clinical trials compared to placebo or not. We don't know the gold standard necessarily in studying nutrients when we have a background diet of nutrients there's no yeah. true placebo right but to do it as well as possible it's it's really only the pharmaceutical companies sometimes the suppliers like Kemen, uh they'll run really good tight tightly controlled trials but it's we need these companies to be able to do it academia can't that the funding's not there yeah yeah, because and again, it's the academics is is important because uh, we can take supplements because academically they should work or academically it makes sense uh, academically. It, but really, it you know, do they work? And the most important thing are they safe? That that's the number yes. one concern. Are they safe? If they're safe, well, then I feel okay whether they work or not in a way because you know, at least I'm not above all, do no harm, you know? So, um, that's that, great. that's, that's key above all, do no harm. So, um, I personally, the way I've evolved in my supplement taking, um, basically I would take supplements kind of by academic, you know, academia, just cause it made, it seemed to make sense mm -hmm. what I was reading and, and what I was coming, but I didn't really know what it was doing to my body. Now, I take supplements that I could tell what they're doing to my body. I mean, the multivitamin, not necessarily, um, the, the one I take, not necessarily, um, uh, I, I can tell, but other supplements. So if I have health issues, so as an aging male, my prostate, right? I have prostate issues and I've taken uh, some supplements that they work. They actually work. And mm -hmm. I've taken the prescription, the pills, and I don't like what they did, but they work. Okay. But I don't like kind of some other side effects that they had. These supplements I take and they work, they actually work just as good as the pill. So you can't get so lucky with all that because, uh, you know, medications, if you're taking a medication for a very specific reason, mo more often than not, you know, it's working and, um, but there might be some fallout to it. 
uh, unless you're taking something for a high blood pressure or something and you don't really know, if it, you know, you don't really feel it working, but it is working. But, you know, getting back to uh, taking supplements for particular uh, uh, issues or, or things of concerns that one might have, that's to me when the rubber meets the road, right? It's when if something works, it works. You can't argue with that, right? So a doctor saying, ah, oh, those things don't work. Oh, there's no study. But if you're taking them, whether it's placebo working or not, it's working. Mm -hmm. it, yes. You know, it may, if it's a placebo effect or not, it's working. So mm -hmm. I know that's hard when you're talking about Centrum Silver. However, now you know there are some studies that are showing that even the multivitamins may have some long-term uh, effects. Uh, there have been some showing that they don't have as much great effects, but not any detrimental effects. Uh, again, there are studies out there yeah. in both ways, but there are more that say they either have no uh, detrimental effects or they have positive. So what are some of the studies that you've seen um, in your career that have shown that some of the general supplements are working? There's there's many, many more than you would think. And it fascinates me that a multivitamin could show any benefit. Yeah. Like it's because we're talking about low levels, a lot of nutrients, low levels. These aren't therapeutic levels that you're studying. Mm -hmm. And again, they're in your diet. So the Cosmo study is the most recently one uh, published randomized placebo controlled trial. That was Centrum Silver versus Placebo. They also had a Coco Polyphenol arm to it. That's a whole nother area. We could talk about that another time, Charlie, but yeah. polyphenols are and carotenoids are another whole area of, of study. But this actually showed, this is about 3,500 patients, three-year trial, and they actually showed um, improvement in memory and slowing and progression of... Um, of uh, cognitive decline. So that was really, it, it, it surprises me that you can pick up on that effect because it has to be somewhat smaller, but you have a large population so you can pick up on that. Um, th there's been, I mean, if you look at studies um, such as phytosterols, I mean, we see clearly a significant reduction in cholesterol. I mean, it gives someone an option, right? Before starting a statin, it doesn't lower cholesterol, total cholesterol to the same degree that a statin does, but it's actually been studied with a statin to have an additive effect mm -hmm. and there's no side effects to it. It just competes for cholesterol in the body at the level of the micelle and helps eliminate the cholesterol. So, um, you know, I, I marvel, you know, people don't know about it and, um, it is a bit of a commitment because they're, they're waxy. It's a waxy substance. They're plant nutrients. They can be found in your diet, nuts and seeds, but you're not getting necessarily enough. Um, so it's a little bit bulky and maybe it's, you know, two to four capsules a day. Uh, but we see real results from that. Um, and the clinical trials are good. Uh, there's so many, uh, the ARIDS trials on the high levels of antioxidants, Centrum was part of those trials and reducing the progression of macular degeneration. We don't have treatment for that, mm -hmm. right? And we haven't found that it prevents, though that would be hard to determine in a, in a trial, hard to determine a negative, um, but also progression of the onset of cataracts just high levels of zinc, vitamin C, E, and then going back to carotenoids, lutein and zeaxanthin. Uh, so those are those are um, some solid NIH trials. There's always a background multivitamin in that, but then they're also driving the uh, the high levels of the antioxidants. Yeah, and and so you you know you mentioned the kind of the the plant derived um, uh, the the phytosteroids, the polyphenols uh, mm -hmm. that we see, and and that's one thing that I've kind of migrated to taking more of the polyphenols, more of the the um, phytosterols, the things that are plant based or that are kind of whole foods, if you will. It's not really whole foods, but it's um, you know, so the phytosterols, those are the steroid. The cholesterol has a sterol ring, and it, so it can it 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 competes with mm -hmm. the receptor 
for cholesterol. So, I, and, and again, this is also, how do we know this? We know this because brilliant scientists have studied it. A lot of those scientists are in the pharmaceutical industry. So, you know, again, I'm just, you know, not that I'm, I'm putting a plug in for the pharmaceutical industry, but what I am saying is that don't discount the contribution that, you know, your demon big pharma has on a lot of the things that you hold sacred. So, um, you know, one of the things that I always loved when my colleagues would say, oh, those things don't work, those things don't work, there's no studies, whatever, why, you know, one of the things is just type in vitamin C into PubMed and you'll get 50,000 studies. So don't say mm -hmm. there's no studies, okay? But another, the thing is that when, they, when someone says they don't work, well, it's interesting because if you have a cancer patient, for instance, who is going through radiation therapy or chemotherapy, one of the first things that their doctor tells them is to stop their antioxidants. Well, if antioxidants didn't work, why would your doctor care if you took them or not? But they do work. And the way that radiation therapy works and the way that a lot of chemotherapy works is that it causes oxidation. It causes oxidation of bad tissue because oxidation destroys tissue. And so if you take antioxidants, you're going to prevent that oxidation of the bad tissue that you want to destroy. So if you, if you believe that it doesn't work, then who cares if you take it or not? So to me, that's proof and that's the argument when someone says, when a doctor says, oh, they, those things don't work. There's no studies, whatever. But um, yeah, but, you know, I, I, I love this conversation because I know that certain supplements that I take and, and I don't, I'm fortunate not to take any, I'm in my mid sixties. I don't take any medications. I'm fortunate in that respect, but I do take supplement. I do have certain issues that I take supplements for, right. like I mentioned the prostate and it, it works for me. I take, I've had for mm. my whole life, uh, GERD gastroesophageal reflux, right? Now I've had that for many years and I don't like to take medications for it. If I do, I might take a Pepsid here and there, but last year I found myself taking more Pepsid than I had in a while because I had some irritation in my stomach. I, I took some antibiotics, whatever. And I really, I had GERD, like was not going away. So I was taking Pepsi maybe for two months. Then I had my blood checked and lo and behold, my B12 level was lower than it had been in year ever really, I think. Mm -hmm. So I cut back on that. I started supplementing with a, a methocobalamin supplement mm -hmm. and I was... Yeah, I, I replaced that. I was I was fine. But those are the things you have to you know. You don't just want to take supplements or or medication over the counter willy nilly because no. they do have some some uh, response. Now, what I take for my GERD helps me. I take a product I take every time before I go to sleep. It it it's it cuts. It's called a Safa Cool and a Safa Guard, and it's you know it's a, it's a supplement that I chew mm -hmm. before I go to sleep. Mm -hmm. It, I don't have GERD. I mean, it, it helps me, but and I, that helps me. That's my personal journey and my personal experience. I'm not saying that's perfect for everybody because sometimes you do need medication, but I like to take supplements now that are targeting certain particular issues that I have. I'll take my multivitamin, which is, is a general thing, but then I'll take other things and and there's a whole now other arena we'll talk about that people take supplements for anti-aging and so there are a lot of different supplements out there that are touting cutting aging and they they all you know target certain areas or cer certain mm -hmm. theories i should say yes. health, okay. health span versus lifespan yeah right? yeah yeah and fda talk just, a little bit about that yeah yeah and fda and can we improve 
quality of life, right? So that's where the health span is, right? Not just having people live longer. Yeah. Um, FDA does not, they're not comfortable with that anti-aging because they feel as though it's very misleading and it can be, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the concern too is while we have good data on antioxidants and anti-inflammatory mm -hmm. nutrients, which the FDA does not like you talking about inflammation, but the two go together. Yeah. So they're really important to talk about. And over over time, it's that low grade inflammation that doesn't get turned off that can lead to chronic disease. Uh, I do think there's too much of a good thing. I think when when people start to cocktail too much and they mm -hmm. start taking single entities and they don't have the background, the education or understanding of how to look at the clinical trials, they can take too much. So I think they have to be careful with that. It can cause an imbalance. You know, vitamin C and E work together. One recharges the other. But if you're not, if you're taking too much of one, you can cause a deficiency in the other. Um, you know, you need iron to absorb, um, you need vitamin C to absorb iron. Uh, we don't want to be taking too much iron too, depending on your age and risk for hemochromatosis. So I, I do think there's a fine line to, to walk. And I love how you talked about, you go back to your multivitamin, it's foundational, but then there's things you need to build from there. Mm -hmm. And we really do. We're not supposed to say as a dietary supplement that we treat, cure, mitigate, prevent disease. But right. the reality is there's real conditions that it's it's helping with. Yes. Um, the zinc and, and eye health, lutein, lutein and zeaxanthin absorb, they sit in the macula of the eye and they help build macular pigment density. Mm. And um, FDA has somewhat approved that as a biomarker in clinical trials. Uh, so the more that, not the more that we take, but taking that on a daily basis as a fat soluble builds up in the eye. It helps to block the harmful uh, blue light. And it's almost like I refer to it as like internal sunglasses. You're mm -hmm. you're really protecting. And then lutein and other carotenoids can build up in the skin and provide a level of photo protection. Mm -hmm. Now we can't say you can't use your SPF sunblock, right? But there is there has been now some studies that show carotenoids and other antioxidants building up in the skin could have a protection broad spectrum of about a four. Right. You'd still need you still need your sunblock. Right. Uh, but can you imagine having that coverage then anytime that you're exposed to any light? Uh, that's helping with with photo protection. There's so much in the space of dermatology and skin appearance and beauty. Consumers are looking for that. Mm -hmm. And we've done a lot of market research. They'd rather take something, a supplement for their appearance than their known diagnosed <laughs> cardiovascular <laughs> issue. Yes, And so that's fascinating. But you know what? Some of the nutrients are going to work in both areas. And um, I ran a clinical trial on a, a product, an oral supplement with um, some carotenoids, uh, some uh, vitamin C and E, and we showed reduction in um, in in the depth of wrinkles and improved glow and mm. appearance of skin. And then we have out there, I've published a review paper for physicians. To your point, physicians don't always know, and they don't they don't have the time or the training right. in nutrition sciences. So we know your patients are taking supplements, and if you're not addressing it. They could be interacting with the medications, et cetera. So we did a review paper. It is limited to the area of dermatology and skin health, but a way that dermatologists can kind of break through and saying, they're taking these herbs, they're taking these vitamins and minerals. What are the questions I need to be looking at? What are the red flags? So that's out there in the in the published literature. And I do think we need more of that. Uh, there are red flags, there are issues. There are people taking retinol at too high of a level. Mm. We want that during pregnancy, right? But then all women of childbearing age need to be getting adequate levels of folic acid or methyl tetrahydrofolate, you know, in case there is a pregnancy that, you know, wasn't planned. Uh, that's so important for the first 21 days of pregnancy to prevent neural, help prevent neural tube defects, right? Yeah. But the communication and that message isn't really out there. Um, or, or being replete, having adequate serum nutrient levels before a pregnancy. How important is that? Yeah. To have adequate folate, iron, 
uh, omega-3s, right? And then after a pregnancy, replete before another pregnancy, right? Is that really, is that message getting out there? Mm, yeah, that that's great. And, you know, the, I, th I think the multivitamin is, is like you said, foundational. And uh, if you're, if my listeners or uh, people are wondering, you know, what, how to balance whatever, it's good to be on a very good multivitamin because the multivitamin is going to be balanced. It's a good one is going to be in balance from a good manufacturer that has uh, adequate uh, uh, quality controls. Uh, and there are certain foundational uh, supplements that I think are important for people to take. And I would say the multivitamins one second would be a good fish oil, um, a good brand fish oil. Now there are actually prescription brand fish oil and Vesipa is, is the brand name. Now there's, there's generics of it, but uh, that's been studied, excuse me, that's been studied and it's um, it's actually the one I take, but I can take it and it's, you know, it's, well, if you have insurance, you know, it, it's, it's inexpensive, but there are also other uh, over the counter supplements that take e that, that are EPA and DHA, which are the top, uh, the two, three major omega-3 uh, vitamins um, or supplements. And kind of a, a quick way to look at it is the EPA is for cardiovascular and the DHA is more for for cognitive, for brain, neur neurologic function, um, but also too much DHA could raise your lipid, could uh, negatively impact your lipid profile. So you always take less DHA. I take DHA, um, I, 500 milligrams of DHA twice a week because I don't want it to interfere with my lipid profile. And that seems to be enough for me. And the EPA I take is about a thousand milligrams a day. Uh, of the Vesipa. So you have your multivitamin, you have your your uh, fish oil, and then vitamin D3 is also a good foundational. Uh, and that's something, I, you know, two to 5,000 uh, international units or more a day or less, but that, that has to be monitored. And, and if you're taking supplements, they need to be checked and, and they need to, to be monitored. And those are just some of the foundational things. Do you have anything that you you particularly uh, light? So, and I take other supplements too, but for particular areas of uh, interest that I have. Yeah, well, I would just add to that too. Yeah. We do have, um, you know, several organizations, but the Institute of Medicine, National Academies of Sciences, they do have established upper levels. So mm. it's a guide also for physicians. It could be a guide for consumers to look up to that don't exceed, say, 10,000 IUs of vitamin D per day. That's a high amount. Yeah. Um, so, but, but, but to be sure that you're not doing it because it does happen. Um, and I would say, say that um, also it's important, and this is what I think it's hard to tell looking at a label, but that there's a toxicologist mm. that's doing an assessment in every one of these final formulations before they hit the market. So the big companies, the really solid companies, absolutely, they have that. And they're looking at lifetime exposure, right? Because there's always some level of risk of something that you're taking in that you wouldn't necessarily be taking in through your diet or you don't want to pay to take in, you know, an extra toxin or an extra, you know, mineral or element that um, we know doesn't have have benefit. Uh, the only, as far as adding on to your um, supplements, some people need to take calcium. A lot of people are avoiding dairy, um, mm -hmm. either for intolerance or it's associated with inflammation. Um, so and you know, anytime you take away a food group, it really can mm. impact the level, the nutrients that you're getting. So likely a calcium supplement, the levels that used to be recommended, that's come way down, you know, to maybe about 600 milligrams of calcium in a day. Uh, there's there's all different salt forms. There's all different competitors out there. There's all different crazy claims out there, um, but a, a calcium carbonate and a calcium citrate bioavailable, well-studied. We know it's getting into the bloodstream. Uh, I think bioavailability is a whole nother mm, topic for yes, supplement. Yes. I don't think it's a it's something that people need to even concern themselves with when it comes to herbs. They're largely not 
absorbed, right? Yeah. But there yeah. might be some benefit hanging out in the colon, metabolites that are produced. Same with calcium. If not all of it is absorbed, it might be hanging out in the colon and having some type of benefit. So there's the whole gut brain access and um, different metabolites that are produced. And I think I think fiber is a big one. Yeah, I miss I that. People, yes. People are just not getting out of it. You need 25 to 35 grams per day. Who can yeah. do that? And right. some people just can't tolerate it. And I don't, I think there's a biz, big misunderstanding of what a prebiotic is and what a probiotic is. But a prebiotic fiber is something that really should be part of your diet. You can supplement with it as well. They tend to be bulky, uh, larger items, but they're going to help feed that good bacteria or the probiotics. And I would just use caution with probiotics. There's wonderful, amazing clinical trials on them, but they're very specific to their genus, species, and strain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can't just take any probiotic and it will have a different effect depending on what it's been studied uh, to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's important, uh, especially um, as I, I mentioned that um, I used to smuggle in or or have family members smuggle in uh, one of the Saccharomyces, uh, which is for uh, floor stores is, is one of the prescriptions that when my patients would be blasted on IV antibiotics in the hospital and they had to, they needed it, they had pneumonia or, or something. Uh, but C. difficile, which is a, a, a cause of, of the antibiotics killing the good bacteria and the C. difficile, which is the bad bacteria, overgrows and causes horrible problems. Um, but taking a probiotic like a Floristore for that particular issue, of I to prevent IV uh, to prevent antibiotic associated infection diarrhea from C difficile is has been studied and and shows to be very effective. I didn't mention that there are a couple other things and I uh, like I said that I like to take um, and get results from C. So they may not be necessarily foundational, but I like it and I see the results. And one of the, a couple of the things are collagen. I've been taking collagen now for the last couple of years, which does have, I take two brands. One is uh, pure collagen and it's a marine derived one. And then the other is a collagen that has uh, some other supplements like glucosamine and chondroitin, which are, are good for joint health and MSM, which is also considered good for joints. And I mix that in, with um, a uh, matcha powder, maca powder, and uh, turmeric, some po those are polyphenols, and those are things that um, are helpful. I feel that they're helping me. My not my hair hasn't grown more, but it's thicker <laughs> the, the amount I have, and my nails definitely from the collagen. I have to clip my nails much more frequently, and I feel that it's helping me. And also, I take uh, when I exercise is creatine, and I I've noticed a real difference in how creatine has helped with my musculoskeletal system. And that those are things that maybe not are foundational, but I take and they work. Nobody can argue with that. You know, mm -hmm. if it's taking and it's, and it's working without any side effects. Okay. That, that works. As long as you're taking the key and the takeaway here, you have to be confident that the brands that you're taking are good and a quality. And, and that's why, you know, you know, that's why I had Lisa here that, you know, you're an expert on that. You've been in that you've seen, have you seen times when you feel like things may not maybe outside of your uh, experience in the pharmaceutical industry, but in other industries, have you been able to, uh, I know you're not there maybe, but what are some of the red flags that you could see if, if a company is not, you know, really, if their quality, is there any, right, that's the question, right? is there anything that you can kind of read between the lines of a brand that tells you whether or not their quality is up the standards? I think when there's a lot of touting of natural, you're likely not getting what you think is on that label. Mm. If you're going to do a natural vitamin C, it's not stable. There's nothing wrong with having it, right? 
but it's not necessarily stable. So sometimes the more natural, and FDA doesn't want you using that word, because there's some type of processing going on in that manufacturing to make sure that you're maintaining that level. That's a huge red flag. Um, the more wholesome, the more from fruits and vegetables, and it's just a natural extract, they're not standardizing or characterizing or making sure that you're actually getting that the ingredient and the component that's the active that has the benefit. You said fish oil, but then you clarified and you said DHA and EPA is where the benefit is. There's a lot of companies out there selling fish oil mm -hmm. and you have very little of the active, which has the benefit. So there's a lot of that. There's a lot of um, misleading claims there's so much out there that's telling you it will do this. There's no proof. It's going to improve memory. It's going to help with your your focus, your um, accuracy, your timing, you know, and we have no evidence of it. So I think it's a combination. It's also um, when they put in a ton of ingredients, when mm -hmm. they have everything but the kitchen sink, that's a red flag. And when they're putting in many probiotics in there, mm. there's no way they're all staying alive. Right. So you may have a lot of dead bugs in there. And, and that's another topic because there's some benefits to that too. But you, there's no way that you can stabilize and keep all of those actives in there. So lots of ingredients, not good. It's a random combination. You know that there's no clinical trials anywhere going on with that. Um, and I would just say that it has something that is there's thought into the combinations that are put together. You can't fix everything into one. Right. And that's why that you go back to the multivitamin because it's foundational. The key there is it's low levels of many things. But when you're putting in high levels and you have many ingredients, likely it cannot deliver on what it's saying it will deliver. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, and and so like you said, the fish oil, you'll have fish oil. Let's say the, the recommendation is to take 1,000 milligrams of EPA, let's say 750 milligrams of EPA and 250 milligrams of DHA. You'll get a, so you think it's 1,000, so you'll you'll buy a, a, a fish oil that says, you know, fish oil, 1,000 milligrams, and you'll look at it and it only has 300 EPA and 200. DHA or something like that. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a, that's a big, really good point. And yeah. So Lisa, I, I think, you know, this is great, such great information. I'm so happy that you came on here today to bring your expertise, your experience with the pharmaceutical industry and, and, and the consumer part of, of that industry, uh, the consumer health part of that industry and consumer labs. I, I think if you are taking supplements, Go, maybe, you know, go to consumer labs and sign up for a, a subscription or something because you can check your particular brand. Again, like you said, Lisa, they don't get everything right, but they have, they get a lot right and they have good information. And um, I've definitely decided on which supplements to take and which not to take because of information that I got from there. So, and I'll put that link on on the, in the description. So again, Lisa, thank you so much for coming on today. Really, really appreciate it. And I'm going to uh, sign off now. And as everyone knows, I'm Dr. Charles Glassman, AKA coach MD, urging you to stay strong in mind, in body and in soul and always question. And don't be afraid to ask questions. Bye for now. <laughs>